Thank you very much. Thanks for having me back. Uh, it's an honor to uh, follow these uh, great uh, speakers. Um, you know, I love this setting. I was hoping we'd just maybe like throw the cushions in the floor and sit around and say, man, you know, it's, it's what I'm thinking about is really awesome. Uh, I had some really wonderful prepared remarks, but now that I realize that uh, it is an insult to the audience to read remarks, I'm going to be forced to just wing it. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, perhaps the greatest lecturer in American history, read all of his remarks, but what did Emerson know? But speaking of Emerson, he once said that there is nothing so foul that intense light will not make it beautiful. But I realized he was wrong when I saw my shoes in these uh, spotlights here. Um, I want to try within the allotted 10 minutes to speak in a way which goes on each side of the very factual policy-oriented presentations that have preceded us. On the one side, I see the realm of theory, the, as I will argue, much neglected realm of theory. Then on the other side, I want to descend down into the putrid gutter of politics. So let me begin with the realm of theory. And I was struck by something that Jim Fallow said in his little postscript to his comments, which was that he'd been preoccupied with the question of whether America was coming apart as the system breaking down uh, for years, and that he thought America had always thought that way and forecast uh, doom and decline. However, I believe uh, now is that time. I'm very pessimistic, and I feel guilty about that as an admirer of Ronald Reagan, but I am extremely pessimistic these days. Some would say that's the natural conservative frame of mind, but I'm feeling it more strongly than ever. Perhaps it's just the oppressive heat and humidity. Perhaps it's the biblical uh, natural disasters that seem to be coming upon us. Perhaps it's the way the all-star game has been screwed up by Major League Baseball, but I am extremely pessimistic. And for that, I want to step over briefly into the realm of theory. And we're not giving sufficient thought to the theoretical underpinnings of our political system. And those of you who read my columns know I like to talk about Plato, I like to talk about Aristotle, I like to talk about Cicero, Augustine, Aquinas, Burke, uh, Locke, Hobbes, Machiavelli. But now theory has trailed off and I see today that I think we have arrived at a point that the American founders who were the inheritors of the thinking of all of those people feared and tried to prevent. It's a product of a lot of things. It's a product of our changing um, culture. And some of these gifts of electricity uh, that we've heard so much about are the very same things that I think are uh, uh, damning us. Uh, right now. And there's no doubt the electronic devices, which so many of you are rudely using uh, while you're uh, sitting here, should be listening to these uh, fascinating presentations. It's a symbol for what's going on in our politics. We're distracted, we're immediate, we're superficial, we're doing a billion things poorly and we can't do the big things well. And I think that's the, the debt ceiling talks are to some degree um, evidence of that. So I'm, I'm limited to 10 minutes and I want to move off of that but perhaps come back to it when we're passing the microphone, I started to say bong, around the uh, uh, couch here uh, and talking about these things. Uh, but I think that we are in a dangerous situation because we are not uh, cognizant of the warnings that these political thinkers who now they're impractical, theories impractical, but they've been warning us about the things that we're seeing right now for a really long time and some would say they've accurately predicted what's happening and I think the dire situation financially, the dire situation with our political system 
is partly uh, a function of inattention to theory. Now, leaping back over the factual policy-oriented presentations quickly to the putrid sewer of politics. I want to quickly talk about it state and nationally. Nationally, I'll use Senator McConnell, not Senator Rand, um, which I don't know if that was a Freudian slip or just uh, or what, but it was interesting. Um, Senator McConnell finds himself in between some rocks and some hard places. For example, he'd really like to be a great statesman. He, he really is a, a, a John Sherman Cooper person who believes legislators have a role to do. And when he has said now divided government can do big things, he really means that. He would like to do big things. But he also meant it when he said he wants Obama to be a one-term president. And those two things are right now quite inconsistent because doing a debt deal, uh, I think, would enhance the chance of Obama being a two-term president. And I think, I hate rarely say this, but I agree with the New York Times today when it said that Obama had moved yesterday, really, to seize the political center. And I think that he did uh, by advocating a balanced approach. Now, I know he did it in a way that you can quarrel and criticize, but he, he did make the statement um, that we want a balanced approach. He, he said he was prepared to give, and I think he's seized the high ground. Senator McConnell, though, uh, as much as he might like to make that deal, he's between his personal history, in which he saw Louis Nunn uh, go with a tax increase and never get elected to anything again, even though everybody talks about what a great governor he was. He saw George H.W. Bush uh, go along with the tax increase, and as fine a man, and I would say pretty good president as he was, he was voted out of office. And so he sees that, and that makes it extremely hard for him to do. He, he has no great love for the Tea Party. That's not the Republican heritage from which he comes. He comes out of the, the liberal Republican heritage. He's moved to the right steadily over the years as the party has moved to the right. And now he sees, he knows that the 2010 elections, the key was, it was not just the Tea Party. In fact, it was not mostly the Tea Party. It was winning the independence. And from the moment of Obama's election, Senator McConnell set about uh, hurting, knocking Obama's standing down with the independence. And that culminated with the congressional elections in 2010. Uh, but now he sees Obama moving to seize those independents back. And he's got this Tea Party problem over here on the other side because he feels the pressure here in Kentucky and with the Republicans in Congress, and he can't, even if he was so inclined to make a deal, he feels like he can't. Now, everybody thinks that Senator McConnell is always thinking three moves ahead like Bobby Fischer and is a great strategist and tactician, and in many respects, that true, that's true. But sometimes, he just wings it like everybody else does, and I think he's winging it right now and doesn't really know how it's going to come out and really doesn't know what's the best political way uh, for it to come out. Now, quickly moving to the state. Bill, cut me off at 10 minutes, please. Thanks, Bill. Um, he, uh, yeah, yeah, you're, he's working on his uh, personal device here under those papers. Um, <laughs> In the state government, I, I want to be careful how I say this because I've offended people in the past. I think Steve Bashir, I think Steve Bashir is a good man, a good and decent man. I think his wife is outstanding. However, at this point in time, Steve Bashir is the perfect governor for Kentucky's obese, unhealthy, poorly educated population because he asks nothing of the people of Kentucky. He expects very little, he asks nothing. He has no agenda. 
He's the conservative in this race, to use those terms in their classical sense, because he doesn't really want to change anything. The one thing that he's changed recently with Medicaid managed care, you know, only because he had to, and you ask, why didn't this happen sooner if we're going to save hundreds of millions uh, of dollars? But nothing else, nothing else. It's status quo, which Kentuckians, you know, we're so proud, but that's perfect for us. You know, yeah, there are exceptions of people who really push the envelope in Kentucky and want to do great things, but it's a small percentage. Everybody else, you know, if there's no scandal, you know, he's fine. And so I think he is um, more or less fine. Um, David Williams, ironically, is the progressive. I use that term not that he's liberal, but he does want to change the status quo and has put out an agenda, which you can like it or not like it, but he has put out an agenda for changing the status quo. He's got a plan for addressing the real tough nuts, tax policy, pension reform, uh, immigration, uh, education. Senate Bill 1, really he had more to do with. Governor Bashir opposed it in its initial incarnation and then with many other things. Once it was going to pass, he started taking uh, credit for it. Um, but that's unusual to have the Republican be the progressive and the Democrat uh, be the conservative. Now getting down just to really pure politics. I did see this RGA ad that started running yesterday for Williams. Um, nice. Not enough. He, he, to have any chance at all, given that he's personally not liked and given that he's at a money disadvantage and given that Bashir's got a big polling lead, and we may not like this as politics, his only chance is if he's running negative ads on Bashir starting now and running them continually through the election. And I don't know that he's got the money to do that. I don't know if the RGA has the money to do that. But it's, it's the chance. And all the good ideas, policy proposals in the world uh, are not going to change that. Governor Bashir has just been throwing money away with these feel good, I'm Steve Bashir, undertaker, preacher's son, good guy. I balanced the budget because I had no choice under the law and the General Assembly made me do it, but I did. That, those ads have been complete and total wastes of money. And, however, I wouldn't have blamed him if he'd been using them to uh, raise Williams' negatives um, even further. But that's uh, terrible politics and uh, we'll hope to get back to theory. Thank you for inviting me. You know, I grew up in a small southern town where the business community decided during a civil rights protest that they were not going to tolerate that kind of dissension in their community. So they self-voluntarily segregated. Uh, the business community took black community leaders to restaurants and all white facilities and to clubs and pretty much dared people to stand up against them. A couple of years later, I was a um, young reporter there, and I w kind of documented how a banker who was in charge of a little regional bank almost kind of took a vision, his vision of what that place could be, and pulled people together and he actually ended up, uh, Hugh McCall, who built Bank of America, also built Charlotte, North Carolina into the third largest uh, banking center in, in the country. So I come here today basically believing in the power of the business community to really make a difference, to really set an agenda to uh, collaborate, to convene. And I've been impressed with the Kentucky Chamber's focus on important issues for the state. Um, the leaky bucket in particular, the Herald Leader has um, endorsed and uh, you know, it's been 
impressive the kind of commitment that you've made to that. Today I just wanted to talk to you to kind of share three personal ideas that I'd like you to consider as the business leadership of the state. First, um, you know, Eastern Kentucky needs a business plan, needs some kind of idea of what economic development will actually bring prosperity to that region. And it has to be discussed and convened that the discussion has to kind of be above the county government and even the state legislature. You know, bring the stakeholders in, but have some kind of discussion where you kind of say, that goes beyond coal. It's not about who's a friend or foe of coal. Because, I mean, let's face it, I mean, the, even with coal, our Appalachian counties are far, farther behind than other Appalachian counties in other states. So, you know, is it going to be energy? Is it going to be adventure tourism? Is it going to be medical marijuana? I don't know. But let's make some kind of decision about what actually might work and then make some decisions about how to invest in it. Because if not, we're just going to let that area, of the whole area of the state, die out or empty out. And that would be a bit shameful, at least not without trying. Um, the second thing that kind of <laughs> concerns me about uh, a lot of things I see, I mean, this, this makes good editorial fodder, but corruption, nepotism, you know, ignoring safety regulations, you know, it's just, I don't know whether Kentucky is worse than any other place, and I wouldn't say that. But what I do believe is that I, that somehow people, there's so little outrage about it from people. I mean, it's almost kind of blasé, as if it's accepted, expected, that, that the government and the businesses that do business with it will basically do whatever they want to do, ignoring the consequences to people and to the future. Now, what I'd like to, ch what I'd like the chamber to consider is looking at some best practices that might be uh, at other states to try to push those in the uh, government and with your members. Also to maybe, you know, things like whistle, strong whistleblower laws, protections. Also the whole idea of, um, you know, just every once in a while just come out and say something is wrong. I mean, sometimes people just, need to be called out because the reality is that when business, when a system is corrupt, it's the same thing as saying it's closed. And we whine and whine about, oh, our best and brightest are leaving us and on and on. Well, why shouldn't they? They can't get involved. They can't get, become part of this, of the system. And people who come from outside of the state have a hard time as well. So that's an important thing that I think a business community can take a stand on. The last thing kind of came to me when I was thinking about um, how can we get people who come from out of the state to get more rooted in Kentucky? And in the process of trying to think that through, I came to kind of conclude that people from Kentucky are not rooted to Kentucky. I think people are rooted to their counties. They love their counties. But when it comes to Kentucky, that's something that um, people have to be more, more people are defensive about it than they are proud of it. 
And some of that defensiveness is based on stereotypes, and a lot of it is based on realities. But how do you, so I'm, I'm thinking it's probably now time to start selling Kentucky to Kentuckians, not natives and, you know, people like me who are transplants. I've, I've always kind of liked that unbridled spirit motto, though I know it's mostly used now to sell the state to other places and to other people. But I think there's a way to kind of turn that motto into something that actually sells Kentuckians on Kentucky. I mean, unbridled spirit, um, it kind of fits the people in Kentucky, you know, kind of that rugged, you know, that's an independent spirit here that, um, that is impressive and it comes with a certain amount of feistiness. So I think it would be good to have something like a public service campaign or whatever where you kind of highlight people all over the state who are doing interesting things, who are kind of tackling problems, you know. Uh, I, think, I think it's Paducah that's attracted the artists from all over the country to come and live there and work. And, I mean, we have tobacco, former tobacco farmers who are finding alternative ways to make a living. I mean, and, and there's, of course, there's the universities and the hospitals and the research and all of that. But I, I kind of like the idea of focusing on just ordinary people, you know, the people in um, eastern Kentucky who, you know, fight against, you unite to fight against, against drugs or whatever, but just something that kind of says, this is who we are. This is Kentucky. And I think, I go back to um, when my daughter was very young. There were these series of ads that ran in uh, black magazines and at, you know, posters that were distributed at black conventions. They were called the Great Kings and Queens of Africa. And I, would, I collected those things and posted them all over my daughter's room. And the message was that I felt like she had potential and that much was expected of her. And I think those uh, brochures were actually put, up, put together by, uh, sponsored by Budweiser. And um, so that, that is the kind of effort I think is needed in Kentucky because all the, the agenda issues that we can put out don't really make much of a difference if people don't have an attitude that they can be tackled. And I don't think that people have an attitude that they can be had. I mean, we do. I mean, leadership, top leadership does, but it's, it's more, it worries me. And I, you know, I have been in Kentucky for 14 years, and I know that's still a newcomer. <laughs> to a lot of people. So I apologize if anybody has gotten offended by anything that I've said. But right now I have a 13-year-old granddaughter who came here as a infant and a three-year-old grandson who was born here. So I want Kentucky to be the kind of place that they can be proud to call home. Well, Vanessa, as someone who's uh, lived in Kentucky all his life, except uh, I think the first 10 days or so in Tennessee, uh, I completely endorse what you say. I think one of our state's problems is that we know we have a lot of problems, and we have kind of an inferiority complex about it. We get defensive about it. 
we like to talk about basketball and the thoroughbred capital of the world and uh, various other uh, uh, things that we should be proud of. But down deep, you know, we know we've got a lot of problems and we kind of feel bad about ourselves. And I think that's a great idea to have some kind of news service, perhaps, to remind people that there are lots of Kentuckians out there doing great things. Uh, the Kentucky Press Association is having a very successful experience with its uh, Kentucky News Content Service. They've got 58 papers that are sharing information, most of them weekly papers that don't subscribe to the Associated Press. And I think that uh, maybe they ought to think a little more about running more feature stories like that. And maybe I, at the Institute for Rural Journalism and Community Issues, ought to think about promoting those kinds of stories. And I, and I can't let go of the fact that uh, you all now have a, a, uh, an online competitor, not much of a competitor yet, in Lexington called kyforward.com, and they accentuate the positive. Frankly, I think they accentuate it too much. Uh, they need to have a head slapper every now and then. But uh, that's the kind of thing you're talking about. I mean, we need reasons to feel good about ourselves. You know, we thought we were going to have a really good reason to feel good about ourselves on Saturday with the big first NASCAR race. I haven't heard one statement yet here today about the biggest issue facing Kentucky. Getting into the Kentucky Speedway. By golly, we're going to have legislative hearings on it. We'll get that fixed up. One of my uh, friends who's also a friend of Senator Williams said that he got more votes by not getting in than by getting in. <laughs> I want to go back to the agenda and, and talk about what the chamber is doing. First, I want to compliment the chamber and Dave Atkinson. The Kentucky Chamber of Commerce has become a force for common sense and a focus on ideas. Sure, it's a business lobby, but it's not reflexively a business lobby. I mean, it gives thoughtful consideration to the issues facing the state. And there is nothing in the Chamber's five major goals that I really disagree with and most of the individual items. Now, we'd have to have a talk about right to work. But like any such agenda, it has some unspoken ramifications. For example, it makes sense to try to expand Kentucky's role as an energy leader. But as we do that, we have to protect one of our greatest assets, one that we often fail to recognize as an asset, our environment. That sort of recognition requires long-term thinking beyond our short-term needs for jobs and electricity, the kind of thinking that Jim Rogers of Duke Energy talked about right here last year. He said, what Kentucky needs, what this country needs is cathedral thinking. The architect never saw it finished, but they had a vision, they had faith, they had commitment. We also need to think about how these issues of education, jobs, health, energy, and the environment relate to each other. We have long realized the link between jobs and schools. Low educational achievement discourages economic development and continued poverty is a drag on student achievement. It's a vicious cycle. Now we're realizing another negative symbiosis. Poverty and lack of jobs hurt our health status. And low health status makes us less attractive to employers. The chamber realizes that and is helping to make more Kentuckians aware of it. One thing you pointed out is the huge growth in the cost of health care for public employees in the last decade, 174%. We can't stand that kind of stuff. The importance of health was illustrated by the inclusion of two articles about it in the Kentucky Annual Economic Report prepared by the Center for Business and Economic Research at UK. When you start putting health in an economic context, uh, it uh, makes it seem more important. I think that uh, our health status in this state is part of our inferiority complex. We're one of the least healthy states in the nation. We're number one in the nation in deaths from cancer, though the rate is falling nationwide. And that's not just because we lead the nation in smoking. It's also a lack of screening, especially of the private parts, colon, prostate, breast, and so on. We don't have that much greater an incidence of cancer, but we have a higher mortality because people don't get screened. We have a health literacy problem that stems 
in large part from our basic literacy problems. We're the sixth most obese state, and we're one of only six where the rate went up last year. 